Britain is about to witness the birth of robot wars. This is robot war. So are you ready for it? Ultimately decide whether they emerge as winners or losers. The robot wars is back. Are you ready for it? As you've just seen, this show is bound to be a belter. Roboteers, stand by. Fighting robots are extremely dangerous machines. So one of the number one important safety factors is the removable link. Now every robot has to have one of these and it's effectively like the switch or the key to each robot. Now we're going to have a look at what a removable link is, where they should be in the robots, how they should work, and then we'll come back and have a look at Terra to see where they've implemented it into here. In the rules of fighting robots, every robot must have one of these. Now this is effectively just a connector with a loop of wire and this connects directly in line with the batteries into the positive side of the batteries so when you remove this from the robot the rest of the battery power doesn't get through to the components so the whole robot's dead. So if we have a look here we've got our batteries this is our power source for the robot we obviously have positive and negative coming out of the batteries the negative we've got going to our components which are here and the positive we've actually got fed off over here. So this is our positive that's come out of the battery. Now at the moment it just comes in here and we use this removable link here to connect the power back up so it goes back down here to the components. So you notice when I plug this in the power has come back through here, it's lighting up our power lights and it's arming up the components. When a robot's in battle, at the end of the battle we can pull this out and the robot will die, so no more power goes to the robot. So another important factor is the robot's power light. Every robot has to have this. Now this is a, a light that needs to be clearly visible on your robot. It can't be behind things. It needs to be surface mounted. So when the power is into the robot, the lights come on and we know that the robot's active. So here we've got our LEDs. So as soon as we plug our link in, as soon as we arm up the robot, the power light comes on, that's the main thing. Now, as soon as we pull the link out, the lights go out, and we know that that robot's dead. Okay, so let's take a look at terahertz now and see where the link and the power light is on here. So, an important factor of the link is that it can't be in the way of weaponry. So we know that terahertz's axe comes over here, so we couldn't put the link here or here or anywhere around the front here. So John's positioned it just in the back here. It's out the way of the main firing arm and it's also out the way of the drive system. Uh, the power light is behind one of the clear polycarbonate panels here so we can see it very nice and clearly. As soon as that link goes in, the power light comes up here so we know it's armed. Pneumatics are really interesting because they give us some great power for our weaponry. So here we've got a CO2 bottle and we have two different types of systems. So a full pressure system is where we use the gas straight out of the bottle for our valves and firing things. And then we have the low pressure system where we use a regulator to reduce the pressure to make it more usable or give us more endurance. So these are the two main types of bottles that we'll use. Um, you can see on this one has a manual isolation valve directly on the top so we can open this to release the pressure. Uh, this one is screwed into the robot so this is a bit like a paintball bottle where you screw it in and that action releases the pressure. If you use this method you do have to have a manual isolation valve directly where the bottle is screwed into. So this type of bottle obviously is come from a fire extinguisher they're really nice bottles to use but one thing they do come with is a dip tube now that's a tube that comes through the center of the bottle down to the bottom and so when we open it it's drawing the liquid through the bottle and venting that now in our robots although it sounds good actually it causes us a lot of problems especially if you intend to use a low pressure system. What you tend to find is the liquid will actually run through the regulators and that can boil off and create high pressure areas even past your low pressure regulator. 
So what's, what we recommend is halving the dip tube, so stuff about here, and if, you're, if your bottle's at that sort of angle, you could then curl the dip tube back so it's about here at the highest point, so we're making sure that we're always taking the gas rather than the liquid that'll be at the bottom of the bottle. So another important rule with pneumatics is they must have pressure relief valves. Now they're designed that if, you, if your system goes over pressure, that they release the pressure and they avoid things like your valves or your piping from bursting. So if you're using full pressure directly, you do still need to have a high pressure relief valve and that needs to be rated below the lowest rated component in your system. So for argument's sake, if you've got piping that comes off at 1000 PSI, you need to have a pressure relief valve that's below that to make sure that that's the thing that releases and not a physical component. If you're running low pressure, you still need to have a pressure relief valve after your regulator to make sure that the low pressure side still doesn't go over pressure. All pneumatic robots need to have a way of depressurizing all the systems. So at the end of the battle, obviously we'll close the manual isolation valve, but then every robot needs to have a dump valve which basically depressurizes the rest of the system downstream. If you have a low pressure system, this needs to be positioned after your regulator to ensure that the whole system is drained. So if you're building custom made components like bottles or rams, they do need to be certified and you need to bring those certificates along with you for your technical check. Naturally our robots do get a bit battered in the arena, so make sure that you check your pneumatic components after the battle particularly your bottles and buffer tanks to make sure there's no lacerations or damage. If your bottles are damaged at all, they can't be repressurized and you'll need to bring spares. If we take a look at terahertz's system, we've got our main bottle here that's very securely strapped down into the robot. That's really important so it doesn't come loose during battle. That's got the manual isolation valve on for releasing gas into the robot. So that comes through this high pressure line through a high pressure relief valve before it goes through to the regulator. So once it's come through the regulator, it's regulated down to about 16 bar. You've then got the dump valve for releasing all the pressure in the robot and a low pressure relief valve to make sure that nothing goes above the 16 bar pressure. From that low pressure relief valve, it then goes onwards to the other components. As with all safety components in our robots, the things that we need to get to, such as the isolation valve and the dump valve, they need to be out of the way of moving components such as the weapons and the drive system. Robots can be extremely dangerous, especially the weaponry. So a really important rule in the rulebook is locking bars. Each robot must have a locking device which stops, stops the motion of the weapon whilst you're arming it up. The device needs to be very strong. We will check it during the safety checks to make sure that when we fire the weapon with the locking bar in, that it doesn't fail. It also needs to be retractable and replaceable without touching any other part of the robot. So Terahertz has a really nice mechanism here. It's got a very strong locking pin which won't bend or snap if the axe is fired. And most importantly, we can put the link in and we can stand back over the barrier, pull the locking pin out and it's safe to go. At the end of the battle, he drives up to the wall without touching the robot. We can reinsert the locking bar and start to disarm the system. Another factor with locking bars is it has to be removable and reinsertable if the robot is flipped over. So imagine Terahertz is upside down at the end of the battle, uh, his axe is on the floor, so he's upside down like this. We can still get in and put the locking bar in without having to touch the robot, without having to roll it back over or anything like that. Hydraulics are great for robots because you can get really high power weaponry like crushers and grippers. But there are a few rules that we need to stick to. Hydraulics are limited to 10,000 PSI and all of our hoses have to be to British standards. These need to be well kept into your robot to make sure that they don't get punctured because we don't want hydraulic fluid leaking on the arena floor. 
Another thing that we need to have is a pressure pressure relief valve in your manifold to make sure that you can't go over that pressure and that needs to be set to the below the minimum pressure allowed in any of your components. Another thing that teams have to provide is a pressure test point. So this can be in the form of a quick release coupling in your manifold somewhere and then you need to provide a test gauge so during your technical check we can plug that in, check the pressure is okay and within the limits and then remove it before battle. So pit safety at Robot Wars is very important. Once the robots have come out of battle, they tend to be scarred, they tend to have damage, and so it's really important that once they're back on the pit table, they're safe to handle. So number one thing is sharp edge protection. So here we've got simple covers that slide over sharp elements of the robot, such as the weaponry, maybe the front scoop, if that's sharp or receive damage, it's very important to have these protective covers on them. When we're back in the pits, another necessary item is our robot cradle. Now this only needs to be a simple device, it could be made out of wood or bits of steel, but it needs to just raise the robot up off the surface of the table. This stops the robot from moving or rolling off, um, but it also means that you can test your drive systems without the wheels touching the surface.